So I think that uh, we can start. Good afternoon to everybody. I'm Andrea Pisarda. I'm a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Catania, and I will share this session on COVID-19-3. Okay, the first speaker is Dr. Ao Kiui. Uh, I hope I have pronounced correctly your surname. And uh, she will speak about tension dynamics on the Chinese social media, Sina Weibo, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Please, you can start. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not yet a doctor yet. Uh, I'm a PhD okay. candidate uh, okay. in, in the Central European University, a PhD candidate in network and data science. It's really a, a great pleasure uh, for me to talk about my recent research about attention dynamics on the Chinese social media, Sina Weibo. Uh, now I will share my screen. Uh, this is a pre-recorded video. Pandemic can help the government Sorry. minimize the effect. Understanding the public attention dynamics on the social media during a pandemic can help the government minimize the effects. In this study, we focus on how COVID-19 has influenced the attention dynamics on the biggest Chinese microblogging website, Sina Weibo, during the first four months of the pandemic. Sina Weibo is often regarded as the Chinese version of Twitter. In terms of the monthly active users and the daily active users, Weibo is actually more popular and more active. And it, it uh, receives, um, however, less attention from the scientific community. Weibo has more uh, vibrant functionalities than Twitter, and one of them is the section of the hot search list, which shows the most searched popular hashtags in real time. Unlike the Twitter training list, the Weibo hot search list is not personalized, and it, it is the same for all the users and with fixed length. Uh, it is very popular and that attracts the most, most attention from the public. This is, an, uh, this is a screenshot of how this section looks like on the mobile phone. There are 50 most popular hashtags on the real-time hot search list ranked by their search volume indices, updated every minute. As we can see from the picture, the third and the sixth ranks are sometimes occupied by advertisements labeled with blue square. The hashtags are competing for attention from the public. This is an illustration of the hashtags competition on the Weibo hot search list. The lower right corner shows the date and time, as well as the total search volume indices of the hashtags at that timestamp. Note that the time here is the Central European time. There are seven hours difference from uh, Beijing time. And now people wake up uh, in Beijing. Uh, it is more dynamic on the hot search list uh, when in a peaceful time. The content on the on this list are uh, often largely related to entertainment, uh, stars, idols, uh, uh, TV programs, and so on. This is understandable because uh, Weibo, after all, is not a news platform, but an entertainment platform. Uh, but in a time of crisis, this changed. As shown here, the blue color indicates COVID, non-COVID hashtags, and the orange color represents COVID hashtags. We can see that the hashtags are changing their positions very quickly. The competition is very fierce. In the day, the change is quicker than in the night when people are sleeping. And uh, in the show and period, we can see that there is uh, quite a large proportion of COVID-related information that occupies the hot search list. What is the effect of COVID-19 on the dynamics of the Weibo hot search list? We took the data uh, from uh, mid-December last year to mid-April this year with a frequency of every five minutes due to the random existence of one or two, hashtag, uh, one or two advertisements. We deleted uh, the advertisements, re-ranked the hot search list and took the top 48 for each timestamp. The second part of the data is from the National Health Commission of China, which includes the daily number of infections, death, and the recoveries in mainland China. We separated our investigated time span into three periods by the illustrated maximum and the local minimum uh, of the daily number of infections. The peak is due to the adoption of a new diagnostic criteria, and the increase after the local minimum is due to the rising number of imported infected cases from abroad. Uh, we have found out that the cumulative number of uh, all the new hashtags 
goes approximately linearly with time. This indicates a nearly constant capacity for news of the users. When we look closer, we observe the growth uh, rate of all the, all the hashtags that goes uh, first linearly, then decreases, then increases, and finally uh, becomes a, similar to uh, the original before the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, the changes in the slope is due to the effects of the COVID-related hashtags. As the blue line shows, the first COVID-related hashtag appeared on the hostage list on December 31st, followed by only a few ones in the following week, and then started to increase rapidly uh, since January 19, which is shown in the inset. The announcement was made by the authority on January 20th that the disease is transmissible between humans. So, so this could facilitate the production of COVID-related news. When we break down into different COVID categories, we observe the men and China related hashtags um, grow, grows rapidly in January, then decreases, and then followed by the rise of other countries in March, mainly about uh, COVID news in Europe and the US. East Asia COVID-related hashtags increased a little bit in April, uh, in February, uh, due to the uh, Diamond Princess cruise ship and the COVID situation in Japan and South Korea. Uh, but it stays a uh, relatively low level uh, throughout the pandemic time. Uh, the ratio of COVID hashtags uh, at different timestamps occupies around 30% to 70% on the hostage list, and the two peaks corresponds to the world pandemic situation illustrated in figure B. And then we uh, classified the mainland China COVID hashtags, in, hashtags into the seven subcategories, the support, which is the uh, worldwide donations or emotional support, or science, uh, good news, bad news, frontline regulations, life influence. We classified them um, based on the semantic meanings. Uh, so how do the daily new number of COVID hashtags in the Men and China subcategories change with time? And what are their correlation patterns with the infections, death and recoveries in different periods of uh, COVID-19? Uh, here we see that in period uh, one and two, the daily uh, new number of hashtags and this is the smoother version of the daily new number of hashtags. Uh, in these uh, categories are dominated by the bad news uh, category with increasing trend in period one and, the, the, and decreasing trend in period two. And in period one, the, the topical correlations are stronger and we can also see the block structures. In period three, the um, regulations, life influence, and the front lines are in a high level compared with the other categories. In this period, the lockdown in Wuhan finished, the medical aid staffs from other provinces started to go back home, the domestic COVID situation is under control, and so that uh, the regulations and the corresponding life influence are not mainly associated with the domestic uh, infection and death, but more associated with the rising uh, number of imported infected cases from abroad due to the worsening uh, world situation. How to describe the attention dynamics on the hostage list by considering the ranking dynamics of the hashtags? We used the rank diversity measure, which is defined as the unique number of the unique uh, hashtags at a certain rank in a given time period. The rank diversity is normalized by the total number of unique hashtags that have appeared on the hot search list during that certain time interval. Here we can see that the rank diversity in the top 48 ranks on the um, hot search list before the uh, COVID-19 outbreak, as well as different periods after uh, the outbreak. The most part of the rank diversity is almost uh, linear before COVID with moderate fluctuations. And after the COVID-19 outbreak, there is a huge gap between the top 15 and the rest of the ranks. This means that there are more unique hashtags that appear at these ranks during this time interval. We also observe the two strange drops at the ranks 29 and 34. To understand why these abnormalities have, uh, happen, we studied the rank diversity of non-COVID and COVID hashtags after the outbreak and found, found out the similarity of the period 
before COVID when okay. taking the non-COVID hashtags after the outbreak. And uh, we observe uh, the gap is greater uh, when taking only COVID hashtags compared with uh, um, all the hashtags after the outbreak. When breaking into different periods of the pandemic, the rank diversity in period one, which is colored in blue, is higher than the later periods. So it shows more, it is more dynamic in the beginning phase of the pandemic. Uh, from these observations, we can see that the abnormally higher rank diversity in the top 15 uh, ranks are due to the COVID hashtags. And this can be the public um, has more preference towards COVID hashtags or, or the Sinaweibo has different algorithm towards COVID hashtags. This reveals the possibility of algorithmic intervention from the platform provider, which is uh, an important aspect when working with the social media data. Actually, here we can see some examples of the natural or spurious rank trajectory plots on the hostage list. Uh, in some uh, unnatural examples, the hashtags stay at certain rank, here uh, 34 and here 29, uh, for a strangely long time without any fluctuation. Uh, compared with the relatively natural rank trajectories on the right, um, so we can uh, see, uh, so this explains uh, the, the drop at the ranks uh, uh, 29, 34 in the previous slides. Sina Weibo may intentionally uh, promote the COVID related uh, important information to make sure people will get aware of them. In this sense, such algorithm, uh, alg algorithmic intervention can be useful for the public. We have also observed uh, an attention decay. When considering the cumulative uh, average duration, we observed uh, an exponential decay shortly after the uh, peak on January 22nd with a slower decay for a longer time. To calculate the cumulative average duration of the hashtags, we used the hashtags whose first appearance was on that day and then assign their duration values for the calculation. And the cumulative average highest rank tended to become uh, lower ranked. This project is supervised by Professor Janusz Curtis. Uh, if you are interested in the details, and um, uh, you could take a look at the preprint uh, in archive. And I would be happy to discuss with you. Mm, now it's time to ask uh, questions. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see if in the chat there are some questions. Uh, yes, there is. Uh, one is, uh, is Sina Weibo used also outside mainland China? Did you observe, expect differences of the attention dynamics in Hong Kong or Taiwan? Uh, so uh, Sina Weibo is also used uh, outside of mainland China. Actually, uh, in, uh, actually in, in Europe or the US, uh, some celebrities also have accounts on Sina Weibo. Uh, but the main, uh, the main proportion of the users are from the mainland China. And so uh, in this project, we didn't uh, take uh, um, the aspects of the in, uh, infected cases from uh, uh, the outside of mainland China, like uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan, also because, some, because of some of the political reasons. So I just uh, took the mainland China data in this project. Uh, okay, I don't see other questions, but I have one. In your last plot, uh, you see a double peak in the decay. Could you explain that? I didn't understand why you have a double peak before the decay. Uh, so uh, let me share. Yeah, this one, yes, on the, on the right, yes. <clears throat> uh, so actually at the beginning, uh, only a, a few um, uh, COVID-related hashtags occur on, on the day. So mm -hmm. the first one uh, appeared on December 31st, and then after that, maybe only uh, one or two or three hashtags per day occur, and they stay there for a very long time. So their duration is very long. And mm -hmm. then after, uh, after some time, uh, the amount of the hashtags they, uh, um, of COVID related become um, very, very many uh, number. And then um, there is limited uh, places on the hostage list. There's only 50 positions. And then, so the average uh, is uh, decreasing. Okay, now, now I understand. 
thank you very much uh, for your very nice talk. And uh, are there other questions? Uh, I don't see the chat. Uh, maybe you should unshare your screen, uh, but I don't see any, any other questions. So we can uh, go to the uh, second speaker, with Sebast Dr. Sebastian Raimondo, uh, who will speak about environmental conditions and human activity nexus, the case of Northern Italy during COVID-19 lockdown. Please, you can start. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen because I have a pre-recorded video. Okay. I think that you can see my big face now. Yes. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. I am Sebastian. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I share the screen with the sound sharing because Okay. Okay. Hello everyone. I am Sebastian Raimundo. I am an environmental engineer and currently a PhD student in mathematics at the University of Trento in Italy. Let me share my screen, first of all. Okay. So, first of all, I would like to thank all the organizers for giving me the opportunity to participate at this conference and to present this work conducted uh, together with my colleague Barbara Benigni and my supervisor, Mario De Domenico. As you see from the title in this work, we are exploring the nexus between environmental conditions and human activity. And we do so by leveraging on the unprecedented condition of the Italian lockdown during the last spring. We focused our attention on the Lombardia region in the north of Italy, which in that period was one of the most affected regions in Europe by the first wave of COVID-19, and also one of the most industrialized and polluted region in Europe. From this nexus, we want also to understand the, the, the impact of human activity on the air pollution in that this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, after a short introduction and background, I will show you what type of data we use it to conduct our study. Then I will show you the methods and the main results before concluding. So just a bit of orientation in space and time and some information about the situation that we study. Here you see a map of Italy with the Lombardia region highlighted in red. These are instead of the provinces inside the region, where you may recognize Milano or Como with this beautiful lake, and the recently sadly famous Bergamo, which was the most affected city in Italy during this uh, spring. And this is again Bergamo. Well, these are all astonishing and beautiful places, but to tell the truth, it is not rare to see them disappear. In fact, this is a rather frequent landscape in Milan, for example. Fog has always been the, the landlord in Lombardia, and now smog has taken its place. The reasons are different. Uh, the main pressures are the transportation and industrial emissions, but the topography makes this region particularly vulnerable. In fact, as you see, Lombardia is enclosed in a basin by the Alps to the north and west, and by the Apennines to the south. This is a limit for air exchange, uh, which increases pollution concentration. Some recent studies proposed a causal relation between pollution and new cases of COVID, but this is not our aim. Instead, we want to study the, the contrary to some extent. We want to know how the effects, the social effects of COVID-19, such as the lockdown, are related to the environmental virus. From the point of view of COVID-19, you probably know better than you the story. This plot shows just the proportion of the Lombardia contribution to the, to the number of infected in Italy during the first wave, which Lombardia was the highest, uh, has the, the highest contribution. This made the social restriction 
it's, uh, it's particularly um, particularly strict in this region. Well, this is the end of, of the introduction and background. So let's have a look to the data. As I said before, we want to find the relation between these two components of the system on them study, the human activity and the, envi the environment. To model human activity, we use a data set of human mobility coming from Google, Apple, and Facebook mo mobility reports. And these re represent a proxy for transportation emissions. Then we have energy production daily data provided by Terna, that is the Italian um, National Society for Energy Production and Distribution. And this is a direct indicator for emission from energy production, of course, and a proxy for emissions of industrial activity. From the environmental side, instead, we have the meteorological condition provided by the Climate Change Service of the European Commission. And finally, the data about air pollution provided by Sentinel space mission of the Copernicus program. In particular, we use the, the tropospheric nitrogen dioxide concentration as a proxy for the air pollution. This is the, the protagonist of, of this work since, as I said at the beginning, we want to understand the impact of human activity uh, during the lockdown, in particular on the air pollution. And we want to quantify the nexus between these variables assuming that they are all part of the same complex environment human system. After a processing phase, we, propose, we, we produce a, the time series for each of the variables. Here is the complete panel with all our variables from the NO2 concentration to wind speed uh, and um, energy production and human mobility. In blue are the data uh, for 2019 and in red, you read once the, 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 the ones for 2012. Unfortunately, as you see, uh, the mobility data provided by Google, Apple, and Facebook are available just for uh, the current year. These are variables, the environmental variables, and these ones are the, the, the ones related to human. So, this is a detail, a detail for the NO2 concentration. This is a two -fold. Uh, it is the, the NO2 concentration in 2019 compared with the one in 2020. As you see, it seems that after the lockdown, the concentration during 2020 are lower than in 2019. And also the variability is deep. Now we can formulate more precisely what are the research questions. Did human activity have a significant impact on the NO2 concentrations and what is the complex nexus between all these factors? The first answers uh, come from the statistical analysis. First of all, we ask if from the nitrogen dioxide time series, um, a regime shift is detectable just from data. And we use an, an ad hoc method to, the, to detect our uh, sort of regime shift in the data using the jensen shannon divergence which is an information theoretic measure to, of similarity between uh, probability distribution. And we employed a, a Monte Carlo simulation to compare the result with a new model. At the point where the, the divergence was significantly higher, we got the date uh, of the tipping point in which the dynamic of the NO2 met a rejection. In the plot, you see the dynamics of the NO2 in the top panel, the divergence in the second, and the p-value at the bottom. The resulting date of the information theoretic uh, let's say, uh, lockdown turns out to be on 14th of March, whereas the real lockdown was on 9th. This result is somehow consistent with the physical behavior of the nitrogen dioxide, which has a typical lifetime of few days. Consequently, we group the time series, as you see in the table, on the bottom right side that we use it to perform statistical tests um, to see if a significant reduction in NO2 would happen after the lockdown with, with respect to the previous year. And the results are reported in the table. The final response is that, yes, the reduction in the NO2 concentration during the lockdown is significantly, is significant uh, with a p-value well below 0.05. Uh, while nothing can be said about the, the pre-lockdown period, but at least uh, the test didn't find a significant difference on average. 
so we, we, we also evaluated the effect size of this test, but now I skip this slide to, to save time, but I can return here later if you want. And in any case, we will find all the details in our paper. Let's see now the results from uh, the exploratory causal analysis. Here is a network reconstructed by means of the partial correlation. Uh, we can recognize some meaningful indexes, for example, between the change in, mo in movement value from the Apple data, that is also the most connected node, to uh, the data about length of stay by Google. Also, the negative relation between residential and workplaces is well captured by the method, likewise for the uh, total precipitation, surface radiation, and temperature. While the NO2 concentration seems to be related just to the surface net solar radiation, that is um, nothing but a, a proxy for the seasonality in some sense. And this is reasonable, uh, since in Lombardia, um, and not only in Lombardia, in spring, the domestic and other types of emissions decreased due to the end of winter. This is instead the network reconstructed with the Granger causality. Here we see again some meaningful relations between the meteorological conditions and also the relations between the human activity variables, which constitute a dense cluster uh, below, and the NO2 concentration also. Namely, the energy production, the residential and park stay variable, and the driving variable, which represented important variables during, during the lockdown, are all related to the nitrogen dioxide concentration. We can also notice the, the possible influence of precipitation on the, on the NO2 concentration. And in fact, the so-called scavenging effect of precipitation on the NO2 is a well-known phenomenon. Finally, these are the results from a Bayesian causal impact model. The basic idea of this kind of models is to generate a counterfactual prediction of the, in this case, of the NO2 concentration which depends only on the environmental variables, and then simulate the NO2 concentration in the absence of the lockdown, in the absence of um, a treatment, let's say. In the first plot, you see the observation of the NO2 concentration in blue and the counterfactual prediction in orange. In the second one is the difference between the two, and in the third one um, is the cumulative effect which can be regarded as the nitrogen dioxide state due to the lockdown. The bar plot shows the inclusion probability of the regressor variables, where the solar radiation, again, which is a proxy for seasonality, appears significant. From uh, the comparison between the counterfactual prediction and the observation, uh, it turns out that the effect of the lockdown is not significant, statistically. This means that even though the decrease in NO2 concentration is significant, the lockdowns doesn't have a statistically significant effect in terms of causal relation. This suggests that the effect might be due to, to chance or uh, to other uncontrollable issues related to, uh, to the data. Uh, in conclusion, we can argue that during the, the lockdown period, the NO2 concentration in Lombardia was significantly lower than in 2019. But this reduction may not be completely ascribed to human activity change. In particular, the seasonality represented by the solar radiation in our case has a great role. These results uh, need to be uh, corroborated with further analysis with other new data, especially for, for the human mobility. But from this analysis, we can argue that the lockdown might be not a good policy for, for pollution control. And we believe that this is a great time to take strategic decisions about sustainability. And complex system science can be a powerful support to design a more integrated environmental policy. So uh, here you find our contacts and the link to or a preprint of the paper where you can find all the details. With this, I finished, and I, I will be happy to answer this, your question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this nice talk. There are some questions. Let me see. <clears throat> so, uh, okay, I have a question uh, from Kachara. 
uh, I have a question with regards to the Jensen Shannon divergence. As I understand, it is calculated between uh, human activity and nitrogen oxide concentration. If so, could you have predicted change in uh, NO2 levels beforehand from the human activity time series? Well, actually, the, uh, the Jensen Shannon divergence is not calculated uh, between these two variables. It's calculated between different time periods of the same variable, that is the NO2 concentration. So we take the time series of the NO2 concentration, we take different uh, periods of this, uh, we, we split the, the time series in different periods, and we compute the Jensen Shannon divergence, divergence for each period in order to see when there is a regime shift in the, in, in the NO2 itself. So it's not a comparison between two, between two different variables, but is a comparison in time uh, between the same variable. OK. Just another question, because we are a bit out of time. Uh, yeah. What features do you use to create a synthetic counterfactual in the Bayesian causal method? What feature do we, uh, we use that, um, the we use we go in R and we use it the Bayesian structural time series model to uh, to calibrate our model and then we give it to the to the causal impact uh, model to evaluate the, the 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 counterfactual prediction basically and to compute the probability of inclusion of the different variables. Okay, thank you very much. We have to proceed and uh, unfortunately. Okay. And uh, uh, no the third speaker is Dr. Matteo Serafino, and uh, he will speak about super spreading K course at the center of COVID 19 pandemic persistence. Please. So, uh, hi everyone. I also have a pre recorded uh, presentation. So, if you want, I can start it. Yes, please. Do you see my monitor? Sorry. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Matteo Serafino, and today I will talk about COVID-19 and uh, network centralities. This work uh, is a collaboration between the group of Professor Hernan Max at City College of New York, where I did my visiting period, and Professor Andrade from the Universidad Federal de Sierra. We also worked uh, in close contact with our data provider, Matthias Travisano, and the local authorities of the city of Fortaleza, which is a city in the state of Sierra, Brazil. And this, it is actually the main target of our work. What I'm gonna, the starting point of what I'm gonna show are two data sets. One, which is provided by the local authorities, contains the list of the person who got tested in Fortaleza between March and April. We have the date of the test, the result of the test, and the day of the first symptoms. While the second data set, contains the geolocalizations of tens of millions of users in Latin America. This uh, data set is able uh, to generate half billion data points per day. And despite this uh, number, the coverage in the city of Fortaleza is around 4%. However, we found no evidence of sampling bias. In particular, we focus on geographic coverage, age, gender, and economic status. As a consequence of this, we can use this data set in order to model realistic digital contact tracing strategy. We do so by overlapping the two data sets and, and, and then find the contact between those people who were testing positive and the healthy people in the data set. First of all, we need to define a contact and we give a special temporal interpretation of a contact. With this in mind, we build a contact network and then we apply state-of-the-art network analysis on it in order to find the optimal way to dismantle the chain of transmission with a minimal uh, disruption. Let's start then by defining a contact. A contact is an interaction between an infected person and an healthy person. Under some circumstances, the healthy person can become infectious and then in turn transmit the virus. The model depends on two hyperparameters, which are R, the contact radius, used to define the probability in space, and T, the interval time, used to define the probability in time. The final probability is the product of these two. The two parameters, R and T, are chosen to reproduce the basic reproduction number 
in the city of Fortaleza at the beginning of the pandemic. That is the first two weeks of March. Second message, a contact can happen only between an infectious person and an healthy person. And the contact is defined with a probability one when two people stay within eight meters for at least 30 minutes. With this in mind, we then build the network. We can fix a window, for example, of seven days, and find in these seven days all the contact between an infected person and the healthy person, between uh, the infectious person and the other healthy person, and so on and so forth, until to define as many layers as we want. We found that four, four or five layers are enough in order to define a meaningful giant connected component. In this graph here, I show in black the dimension of the giant connected component over time. In blue, the mean square displacement, which is the average of the average displacement of the users in the data set. And in green, the cumulative number of cases. We can see that despite the giant connected component dropped by 90% one week after the mass quarantine, and so the mean square displacement, the reproduction number drop up to down to 1.2, but it didn't drop below one, which is the critical value to stop the pandemic. So we are wondering why did this happen? Why despite the mass quarantine, the virus uh, keep, kept, kept spreading actually among the society? So take home message, mass quarantine, quarantine sorry, is not enough to dismantle the chain of transmission. And we are wondering what kind of structure are sustaining the pandemic. So by looking at the structure of these networks over time, we recognize a really drastic change from an airborne structure before the mass quarantine, which is highly connected uh, with the high average degree to a sparse uh, a cluster structure where uh, people inside the cluster are highly connected, but cluster are loosely connected among them. Interesting enough, the structure persists one month after the quarantine. And we have the reason to believe that these are actually the structures which are sustaining the pandemic. In order to understand what kind of structures are these, we need to define K-Core and K-Shell. K-Core is the maximal subgraph with a degree at least K, Why K-Shell, and I'm sorry for the not mathematical definition, is the difference between consecutive K-Core. In this example here, the green area highlights the, the maximal for core, while the green one highlights the first shell. Of course, all the giant connected component is the first four. For what we said before, there are some structures which are cluster where nodes inside are highly connected, which sustain the pandemic. This cluster, we have the reason to believe, corresponds to the maximal course inside the network. To understand whether this statement is right or not, we define two quantities, the half shell and the half core. I would like to stress at this point the maximal course in the, inside the network can also be disconnected component. Then we study these uh, quantities over time. And what we find is actually quite interesting because here we see that uh, in cyan or cyan, uh, the alpha shell uh, drop by more than 90% after the one week after the quarantine, while the maximal, uh, the half core show a, a increasing or at least not decreasing trends. This is the proof that uh, these are the structure which are sustaining the pandemic. Interesting enough here, these structures may be connected by few links. So peripheral case shells are disintegrated by the mass quarantine. The virus kept spreading among these maximal case cores by means of just few links that we call the quick links. The question here is, okay, once we found this structure, how can we stop the spreading of the disease? We, we have actually two strategies. We can destroy the core or try to isolate them. Here is a one-to-one -one map between the key core and the location where actually most of these contacts happen. We can see that the maximal cores are geolocated inside uh, the three biggest hospital in the city of Fortaleza. This result is telling us that in the maximal K course, we have in general essential workers, which of course they cannot be quarantined. So the destroy, this, uh, destroying the maximal course is not something feasible. What we can do, or 
on the other end is try to isolate these maximal faults. And we can do that by removing these weak links which connect the maximal faults. As a common practice in the network theory, we need to perform what is called percolation. We actually perform a random percolation, which is the worst one because we are removing nodes randomly. We also perform a K-core percolation for what we said before, K-core percolation is not optimal. And moreover, K-core by definition are hyper-connected structure. So it will be even too costly, even though there wouldn't be there the essential workers. We also use uh, collective influence, which performs slightly better than the others, but it's not optimal. And uh, finally, the between the centralities, which is the winner of our analysis. We can see here that just by removing a few nodes with the ideas between the centralities, we can completely destroy the network and isolate the maximal cause in the network. We are happy because in such a way, we. We, we leave the virus spreading inside the, the maximal cores, but not outside them. In this way, we think it's possible to, sp to stop the spreading of the disease among the society. This is actually a celebration of uh, to the strength of weak ties, which is in the social theory of Granovetter in 1973. And the main idea is uh, that weak links should be isolated for optimal quarantine. So the best strategy to dismantle the structure remaining after the mass quarantine is by using between the centralities. Isolating people with the I guess between the centralities correspond to remove the weak links connecting the maximal cost. Conclusion, mass quarantine is quite effective to reduce the dimension of the giant connected component from uh, up by 90%. However, this does not affect the maximal cost inside the, the network. These cores are connected by weak links and the virus keeps spreading among these maximal cores by means of these weak links. So to a mass quarantine should be follow a micro quarantines. That means isolating, which will mean isolating the maximal cores by removing all those people with the highest between the centralities. In such a way, we are able to isolate the maximal cores and so to stop the spreading of the virus, but without interfering with essential workers. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Let's see if there are uh, some questions. Mm. Okay, there is one from uh, Alain Barra. Uh, GPS usually does not work indoors, but most documented infection events have occurred indoors, if I'm not mistaken. Thus, I wonder about the use of such data for COVID. So, yes, actually, all this work was at the beginning taught for an app that uh, was going to be built in uh, Brazil, in the city of Fortaleza. So, the idea was not to use GPS data, but Bluetooth uh, data. We also had the authorization from the local authorities. And at the end, this app was also deployed in Fortaleza. But uh, the main problem there was that uh, most of the people were not uh, using, using or downloading the app. And so at the end, it turned out that the app was not efficient. Uh, local authority also thought to oblige those people who were getting tests to report the result of the test in the app. But then they didn't uh, went through for several reasons. Uh, so yeah, this may be the huge problem. The alternative was would be Bluetooth or uh, auto certification of people. But uh, okay, this then is up to the government to decide whether uh, this can be done or not. The main idea here was just to show that to a, to a mass quarantine, it should follow a micro quarantine. And uh, somehow by using some network tools, we can identify those users, we should be quarantined in order to stop the spread of the disease. Yeah, thanks. There is another question. Sebastian Bental asks, nodes with I between the centrality may also be those with the highest value to the functionality of the network. How can one show or assess whether these highly central nodes are inessential? Uh, I think that here the point is not really whether these uh, nodes are inessential or not. But removing a node doesn't really mean to completely remove. Once you test that there is a person which is actually moving maybe among hospital or a warehouse or 
business building, the idea was uh, either to check this guy continuously to test whether he's uh, positive or not. If it is uh, anyway, you have to impose the quarantine or uh, when you test that is uh, actually really tested positive, then maybe to try a substitute. So someone can, can, that can actually make his own job for the time that the original guy stay in quarantine. Just the last question by Gallotti. What are the spatial and temporal parameters set to define a contact? The, so the spatial parameter is the contact radius. So imagine that I'm an infected person. In order to define a contact, I should see how many people pass close to me. This close to me is that the people should at least be within eight meters of radius. radius while the time uh, hyperparameters is how much this guy spend, spend with me in, in these eight meters. So suppose that uh, me and uh, someone else are in a circle of eight meters for five seconds. This will be, yes, a contact with, with the probability that it goes to zero because the time interval is really low. While if we spend at least 30 minutes together, then there, is, there are high chance, chances that actually the other guy got infected by me. Thank you very much. We have to stop here and we go to the last speaker of this session, which is Dr. Michele Tizzoni. Um, Thank you. Please, and, uh, you can start. Yeah, mm. sure. Good morning, everyone. I will be the only one without a, a recorded uh, presentation, so I will go straight uh, uh, sharing the screen with, the, um, with my slide, with my slide deck. I hope you can see that. Yes. Okay, good. So um, I'm going to talk today about the socioeconomic determinants uh, of mobility responses uh, uh, to the COVID-19 mitigation policies uh, enacted in Italy um, during the first wave of, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, I'm a senior research scientist at the Institute for Scientific Interchange uh, Foundation in Turin, Italy. The main motivation uh, behind uh, 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 this project is that it's, uh, it's known, I mean, it's been observed that mobility reductions during the pandemic uh, uh, are not uniform across the socioeconomic groups. And this has been shown uh, uh, previously in other works, for instance, in, uh, in this paper uh, appeared on the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences for the case of the US, but also in other um, works in Japan or, or France by the group of uh, Vittoria Colizza, that typically uh, the ability to comply with social distancing orders uh, is strongly associated with income. So with people with a higher income are more able to comply uh, with the orders, so they reduce their mobility much more than uh, uh, people in the uh, lower socioeconomic uh, uh, state, with lower socioeconomic status. However, this has been studied uh, mostly related only to, to income and typically only in the case of, the, uh, of when orders are imposed, are enacted, but not actually, not much when they are lifted. And so uh, our main purpose of, of, of this work was to study uh, how uh, the reaction, the, the response of mobility uh, to the um, orders imposed in Italy during the first wave of COVID-19 changed during the whole course of the outbreak. Uh, here in this, in this figure, we see uh, the number of confirmed, the new confirmed COVID-19 cases between February and June this year in Italy, and some milestones of interventions that took place uh, since the February 21st, when the first case was reported, then March uh, 12, the, the, the start of the lockdown, until May 4th, then the, when the lockdown was lifted and gradually activity returned back to normal. So we studied how mobility changed during this period and how this uh, responses were associated to different uh, uh, socioeconomic variables. To do so, uh, to study the mobility of people uh, in Italy, uh, we used, we analyzed uh, location data, uh, privacy enhanced and the identified of uh, Italian smartphone users provided by Cubic, which is a, a location uh, intelligence uh, data company. Uh, in this case, we analyzed a, a sample of users that were active every week from January 18, so a month before the, the start of the outbreak until June 24, uh, 2020. We don't have any demographic health or socioeconomic information about the users 
users themselves. All, all our inference is done based on uh, uh, social demographic data that we uh, collect from uh, the Office of Statistics, uh, as I will explain later on. And users uh, are users who opted in to share their data. They can opt out at any time. Uh, this data set uh, that we analyze has been uh, published uh, uh, during the year uh, in, uh, in this paper I mentioned here, um, scientific data is a data descriptor and uh, aggregated data are, are publicly available, uh, the, the mobility metrics we created. Uh, specifically here in this uh, presentation, I will focus on two different mobility metrics that we extracted from this data. One is the radius of duration, which is a very common uh, measure of the typical distance uh, traveled by an individual uh, uh, during this or her daily movements. Uh, uh, from his uh, center of mass. And another metric uh, uh, is, an is not an individual uh, mobility metric, but is an aggregated mo mobility metric. Uh, uh, it's uh, um, a measure of the co-location of individuals. Uh, is the average degree of a network that is built by taking the positions of individuals every hour at the distance, at the radius distance of 50 meters. So when two individuals are closer than 100 meters, we place a link in this uh, hourly network. And then we average the degree over the uh, hourly slices on, on, a, on a given day at the level of uh, Italian provinces. And, and then we, uh, we measure this quantity uh, over, over the day uh, of the outbreak. Uh, to get a sense of what is the timeline of these mobility reductions in Italy, what has been the timeline during the, the study period, we see here that uh, we define a baseline, that is the, the time period between uh, uh, January 18 and, uh, and February uh, 20, uh, and we compute the reduction with respect to the, the, to the baseline uh, day by day of this, uh, of this metric. Here, for instance, I'm showing the relative reduction of the radius of duration as a percentage with respect to the baseline, and here, and the box plot, uh, the, 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 the lines correspond to the uh, different uh, reduction uh, across provinces in Italy. So in uh, 107 provinces of Italy over the, the course of the outbreak. So in the period before the lockdown, uh, end of February until uh, March uh, 12, then during the lockdown until uh, May 4th, and then in the so-called phase two, when the lockdown was lifted uh, until, uh, until June. Um, as first thing that we observe is that the reductions uh, in the radius of duration uh, across provinces were not uniform uh, across all the provinces of Italy in all the three periods. So uh, before the lockdown, for instance, there were provinces that were early affected by, by the outbreak and also by some early restrictions where the uh, radius of duration decreased more with respect to the baseline than in others, like for instance, uh, in the map on, on, uh, on the left, um, the Valle d'Aosta or Trentino, the northern provinces that are close to the mountains uh, where actually the radius of duration was actually increasing a little bit with respect to, to the baseline. Then when we enter the lockdown in the map in the center, we see that there is a more uniform reduction, but still with some differences by, by provinces and some provinces like Milan or uh, uh, close to Lombardy, the reduction was, was uh, stronger than, than in the south. Uh, and then as we went out of the, of the lockdown, again, there is a uh, as a certain heterogeneity in the, in the uh, reaction of, of the mobility. The provinces is white are those that we do not take into account because our sample is too small to, to study them. And in our work also, we do not focus only on provinces, but also on urban areas. So we study how much the mobility changed and what were the, 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 the responses, mobility responses in neighborhoods of three major uh, urban areas in Italy, Turin, Milan, and Rome from top to, to bottom. These are three big urban areas with the population around 1 million or more like, like, like in Rome and for which we computed the, uh, the uh, spatial proximity network and the relative change of the average degree of the spatial proximity network uh, in each neighborhood of, of the city along the whole uh, uh, period. And here again, we see that the, we observe an heterogeneity of, of the reduction. And typically we observe that the city center of, this, uh, of the cities uh, is the, the area where the reduction is stronger uh, it's, uh, it begins uh, earlier, it starts earlier, and then it remains higher, a stronger reduction with respect to the baseline, even after the end of the lockdown. The case of Rome, for instance, is, is interesting also because we see that uh, has, is a, as a big city in central Italy, uh, before the lockdown, actually, there was not a strong reduction in the, in the average degree. In some neighborhoods, uh, we still observed uh, 
an increase of the average degree, then the lockdown, uh, we observe uh, that there is a more homogeneous reduction. But again, in the phase two, we see, the, see that the periphery usually is the, the, are those, uh, those areas where the, um, the, the, the mobility starts earlier uh, with respect to, to the rest of the, uh, of the city. To uh, statistically analyze uh, which are the socioeconomic determinants uh, of these differences, of the spatial differences in, uh, in mobility uh, responses, we take into account uh, a, a large number of uh, socioeconomic features, demographic, economic, and epidemiological. Here I'm listing those from most official sources. In the demographic case, we consider the percentage of females, the old age index, uh, the fraction of people in higher education, population density, fraction of residential buildings. We take into account economic variables, average income, unemployment, the number of commuters, fraction of the labor force in different sectors. And then, of course, we take into account the epidemiological variables, because, of course, these have an impact, uh, the number of cases and, uh, and the orders. Of course, in some regions, some orders were put in place before the national lockdown in the northern, northern Italy, closure of bars and restaurants, large gathering bans and, and school closure. Uh, and then uh, here I'm showing uh, uh, the, for example, three weeks uh, of the three phases we are considering the before the lockdown, the lockdown and the phase two. And uh, uh, each box plot corresponds to one day and uh, the, the, the box plot is, is done over the provinces of Italy. So we see the dispersion in the, in the relative variation of the radius of the of duration with respect to the baseline. And we fit our model, this is a, a multilinear uh, regression uh, with a lasso that selects the, the, the variable to select the variable, to make the variable selection. And the model, uh, and see in the bottom here, we, I, I show the results for each day, uh, which are the variables that are selected by the model to explain the variation in the reduction, uh, the difference by, by provinces. Uh, those are the variables where uh, there is a colored box. Then if the variable is uh, statistically significant, the association is statistically significant, also the box is uh, as, a, as a black uh, um, line, contour line around it. And then the association is color coded. So a green value means that the, uh, the variable is associated with a, a stronger reduction. And the brown uh, means that the variable is associated with uh, a smaller reduction. And uh, I mean, there are several variables, but here I'm alighting uh, some of the, of the key, uh, few key results. So for instance, uh, the variables that are most uh, commonly selected by the model to explain the variations are those that are related to the labor force. Uh, so to the labor sector, how uh, different uh, people work in different uh, sectors. So uh, unemployment typically uh, is always associated to a stronger reduction. So where there's a higher unemployment, uh, there was a stronger reduction in mobility. Um, also the uh, working in the industry was associated with, uh, with a stronger reduction. While on the contrary, working in agriculture, especially during the lockdown was associated with a smaller reduction in mobility, which makes sense uh, because we know that uh, the agriculture sector was actually still uh, operating uh, even during the lockdown to maintain uh, the food, uh, food services. Services, the fraction of the, of the workforce that, that work in services is uh, associated with a stronger reduction uh, in during the phase two, typically not before, but during the phase two, which is also me, uh, as, as the sense uh, makes sense because it's uh, related to the fact that uh, during the phase two, there was still a lot of smart working and the touristic services were of course not, not operating. Uh, Another important uh, uh, result uh, the, that you observe uh, in cities instead is the fact that basically uh, the variable that is always selected as the most relevant to predict uh, a stronger reduction is the high education variable, which reflects uh, exactly the, the phenomenon that I mentioned before. So the fact that city centers and more and wealthier areas uh, are those that experienced a, a stronger reduction, a desertification, as we call it. Uh, the people disappear from the city centers and do not come back even in the, in the phase two. Another uh, interesting point is that there, there is also during the lockdown an increase uh, in, uh, so a, a, a smaller reduction uh, than an increase in mobility in relative uh, uh, where there are more residential buildings and typically uh, in, the, in the outskirts of, of the you city. You should conclude that it's uh, okay. I'm, uh, I'm at the conclusion. So different mobility responses we observed that uh, in Italy were associated to uh, differences in the labor structure. 
other demographic factors were also associated to larger reductions, as for instance, older populations in, in the provinces. And in large urban areas, we observe this effect of desertification that I just mentioned. Uh, this work is a preprint, uh, is available on the Med Archive uh, as, as a preprint. And uh, of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, Leticia Govan, Paulo Bayardi, Manuel Pepe, my colleagues uh, at the Institute for Scientific Interchange for uh, their uh, valuable contribution there. They, for this work and Brennan Lake and Filippo Privitera at Cubic uh, and the supporters um, from the CNCRT. And uh, thank you for your attentions and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Let's see if there are questions. And just stop um, sharing the screen. Yeah. Okay, no questions. And when I've seen that uh, in the reduction uh, in the plot that uh, you have shown, there are some oscillations, some periodicity, which probably is a weak. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so the typically the pattern is that there is a, there is a, a weekly pattern, so that the, there are a steeper decrease during weekends. Uh, because during the weekdays, uh, people were still working, uh, some, some people were still working. So basically, uh, we, we controlled for this by taking uh, the, the relative reduction in each day compared to the baseline computed on the same day. So here, the, the reduction that we want to, to explain on, on a Sunday is the reduction with respect to the typical Sunday. And the reduction on a Thursday is the reduction with respect to a typical Thursday. So because, yeah, I mean, this is, of course, our, our relevant patterns. And, and I think also there is a question by uh, Riccardo yes. Gallotti about uh, car ownership. Did you control for car ownership? Uh, so no, this is an information that we were not able to um to yeah to to discover or, or to include so uh yeah i mean cl clearly i mean there there might have been other other socioeconomic variables i mean I, also i have to say that we did not include so we included more variables than those that that are shown in the plot but some of them are discarded automatically by the model during the variable selection uh but yeah car ownership uh, was not included we, we did not have information about that Thank you. Uh, thank if there you. are no more questions, then uh, let's thank all the speakers and uh, let's close this session on uh, COVID-19 and uh, see you later. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.